beg for his love that he gives freely. had a good yesterday, and uh, I'll see you in just a minute, but uh, this morning I want to continue uh, in the book of Genesis with, with uh, the thought uh, that we, uh, can you turn these on, uh, Nate? Um, I want to look some more with, about Joseph, oh perfect, thank you. We're going to go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 39, and, and uh, here in just a few minutes, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about eight hours or so, big game will happen this afternoon, and uh, millions, and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people will be tuned in, and, and they'll watch the two teams battle for the national championship. And after all the talk, which I think it's supposed to start like noon or 12.30, something like that, and they'll get all the commentary, and they'll get all the different people's opinions on this player and that player, and, and, and you'll have all of the wealth of information. The two captains and, and the captains of the team will walk out in the center of this great stadium filled with people, uh, who knows how many people are going to be there that has purchased tickets for thousands of dollars a seat, some of them. And they'll walk out to the center and they'll huddle around and they'll exchange some words and I don't know if they'll talk about uh, footballs being inflated properly or not. They'll probably take care of that before they get out there. But then they'll go to the center and they'll take a coin, I think it's a silver dollar, and they'll have one team call whatever's going to be heads or tails. And they'll flip it, and they'll determine who gets the option of whether they want to receive or punt or kick off first. And that's sort of about the story of life. And this morning, I want us to, again, look at Joseph. And I want us to look at uh, something that's, that happens 
in our own lives, just like it'll happen here in just a few hours there at the football field, we'll find out today that just as this book has a, what's this called? Yeah, amen. We still remember what this is. It's full of some good stuff too. But this is the front. And you see how this is? Got letters and everything on there and then you got the back. You'll see the title. Sing to the Lord. And on the back you'll see nothing. What does that represent? We call this the front. And then we call this the back. On a coin, you have heads and you have tails. Um, what does that tell us? To a story, that, in a story, you'll have one and then you'll have the other side. In life, you'll have the high road and you'll have the low road. You see a pattern developing here? Does, what I want us to look at today is that life has two sides to it. Uh, and we'll see this as you, as you look at the story of Joseph, as we look at that the last couple of weeks, we see that Joseph came from a good family, a good house, that he was very well loved, very highly favored over the, the, the rest of his brothers, and, and uh, that because of some dreams that Joseph had, Joseph shared his dreams, and that upset his brothers, and make a long story short, his his father sent him out to check on the brothers and, and the brothers saw him coming and they threw him in a, in a pit in a, in a dry cistern and from there they, some uh, evidently and his brothers uh, even considered killing him because they were, they were jealous of, of the favor that, that uh, Joseph uh, shared with, with his father and uh, so uh, they said no, one of the brothers said no, let's don't, let's don't, let's don't kill him because uh, that means we'd have blood on our hands but not to think that, that they've already thrown him in a pit and chained him up and uh, that they were innocent of doing no harm. They had already done wrong, but we don't want to kill him. We don't want to go that far. So they sold him to, remember, some, some uh, Ishmaelites and, and they took him down to Egypt and uh, we left off last week. And now Joseph has experienced the good side of life and now all of a sudden his life has been turned around and he's getting ready to share some low side of life. Remember? And this is where I want us to pick up today uh, because Joseph found that in Egypt, he found what the other side of the street was like. Remember, he had already had the coat of many colors that, uh, to, that his dad gave him that, to show favor and love. And now Joseph was experiencing the auction block. We talked a little bit about this last week that we don't know how the bidding went, but I'm sure they wanted a whole lot more than what they eventually got for him. But he was sold to, to Potiphar and he went into Potiphar's house. And Joseph had every right, every right to be down in the dumps because again, Joseph was experiencing the high side of life, favor with the family, and then now he is no family. No wealth, no credentials, no nothing. He went from being free, he went now to being a slave. Joseph had every right, we may think, to be ill, Negative, mad, upset, lost, depressed, you name it. On the negative side, Joseph had a right to be that way because he lost everything. This is life. But let's look today, and if we, if we look to see, because he had from dad's favor, now he's a slave. From the best of everything, now he's experiencing the auction block. From the freedom of, uh, of going and coming, now he's in chains. It's interesting that when, when we chose a spouse and we stood before the, the, the minister and, and when we uh, made our vows, we said, he said something like this, for richer and for poorer, and in sickness and in health. What does that show? It shows that during your lifetime, you very well may experience, I guess we lost be healed. Life is going to have, very well possibly in your life, it might have an upside, and all of a sudden it might turn and have a negative side. That's life. And this is what Joseph experienced right here for rich and for poor, in, in health and in sickness, whether you're riding, or your car blows up and breaks down and you have to walk, 
Whether you have a big family or you're an orphan, whether you have everything and then all of a sudden you have nothing, this is life. And you have to make the best of it. Because you know there's one truth that goes to the rich and poor and this truth is this. I don't care what happens to you. Well, I do care, but I'm just using this as a figure of speech. You know what? Life is going to go on. It will. Other people are going to go on living. Their lives are not going to change. It might, it might be affected in some way, what's happened to you, but life will go on. And you'll have an option. You know what the option is? It's to shrink back in the shell, draw up, be negative, be resentful, be hateful, be mad, and live out the rest of your days in ill-tempered, ill-mannered. And, and, and let me just say this. If you choose that, Satan will make sure that you're miserable. He will absolutely make sure you're miserable. Because that's what he wants. Because see, Satan's whole plan and whole scheme of this, as we walk through life, no matter what life is, whether what side of the book we're on, what side of the coin we're living, Satan wants to make sure that whatever he does, he keeps us from being joyful. And he wants to make us miserable. Don't take it personal. He does that not because you are uh, a Frederick or a Smith or a Jones. That means absolutely nothing to him. He wants that for you because you are God's creation. Because God developed you. God created you. God designed you. God has a purpose for you. God wants to see you be happy. So therefore, if God wants to see you be happy, he wants to see you be miserable. Because God is good and Satan is two sides. So as we look at this today, I want us to read some scripture here in Genesis. And I think, uh, Alyssa, I have it on the screen. It's in Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 through 5. And this is how it reads. The Lord was with Joseph. Remember, he was walking down the sand, walking down to Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, and he, and he was a successful man. Now just stop right there. You know what happened to Joseph. He went from this side, and now he's in bondage. But the Bible says he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. He'd been sold into Potiphar's house. And his master, which was Potiphar, saw that the Lord was, listen, look at this, and the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, in Potiphar's sight, and served Potiphar. And then he made him oversee his house, and all that he had, he put under his, Joseph's, authority. So it was from, that, from, from the time that he had made him oversee of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house, blessed Potiphar's house for Joseph's sake. Not for Potiphar's sake, but for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. All that he had, wherever Joseph went, the Lord blessed it. Whatever Joseph did, the Lord blessed it. Why was that? Well, we're going to look today. Again, Joseph, Joseph now was experiencing the bad side of life. He had went from here. He had went from freedom. Joseph is a slave. But yet, even on the downside, even on the negative side of life, God continued to bless him because Joseph never gave up on God. There's a lesson here. What's the lesson? When we experience the downside of life, and will we ever experience the downside of life? I see some head shaking, yes. And some of you have already went through it. Some of you are in the middle of it now. Some of you have the potential to go through it next week and next month. Don't give up on God. Because God's not going to give up on you. And this, likewise, this is what we find here. And see, Joseph found out let me tell you some things that, that, that we need to know here because they are so relevant today. We talked about last week as Joseph was traveling down to Egypt, 
Joseph was a human being just as we are, and as he was shackled and chained and probably walking through the sand and leaving his footprints in the sand, walking down to Egypt, he had to have things going through his mind. And probably what was going through his mind is what was taken away from him and the wonder and the unknown of what was to face him. But yet, what kept Joseph sound, he never forgot the dreams that God gave him. He never forgot God. That's what kept him afloat. And now Joseph, even though he is experiencing the downside of life, he hasn't given up on God at all. That's what's keeping him going. And we see here, Joseph knew and understood that in this time of life, I don't know how many self-help programs there were back in those days. I don't know if you could run down to the, to the corner store and get you a scroll on, on some uh, self-help remedies on, on positive thinking. Uh, years ago, and I'm talking about decades ago actually, I worked for the Pillsbury Company and I was managing a steak and ale restaurant for them down in Athens, Georgia. And uh, they had a big seminar, and years and years ago, a man named Kenneth Blanchard, I don't know if you've heard, ever heard him or not, but he wrote a little book. It was called The One Minute Manager. And it was a bestseller, and it was the talk at that time, decades ago. And Pillsbury Company decided that this was such a great book of positive thinking and positive motivation and showed you how to manage the thing and multitask and all that. They spent, I don't know how many, of ten, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars and sent all of their 180-some restaurant managers and key employees to Lake Tahoe. Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. On an all-expense paid to listen to Kenneth Blanchard talk to us. He was very good. But Joseph found out that not all the self-help programs was going to help him in this situation. He also found out not uh, all the, the positive thinking that he could muster up could not change the situation. He also found out that, that it wasn't who you know because he didn't know anybody, so that couldn't help him. You know what Joseph finally realized when he was standing on that auction, auction block and they were bidding for him and Potiphar got the bid? It dawned on him that he was totally under God's control. And there was absolutely nothing he could do other than hold on to God and let God work it out. Ever been in that situation? Some of you have. I know you have. May have come in the form of a phone call. That was your trip down to Egypt. May have come on and knock on the door. And you found the reality of life that you went from this side of the coin to that side of the coin. And there was absolutely nothing in your power you could do to get through it or change it. And that's the very time that Joseph really grabbed on to God and held on. And we see the results. We saw the results in that. Uh, Joseph found out it wasn't no digging a little deeper that would solve the issue, no working harder to bring about a better outcome, no thinking more positive would turn around the situation, not even making more concessions. That wouldn't change a thing because he had no concessions to make. He was a slave. Joseph could never, what Joseph found out, that Joseph, no matter where they took him, no matter where the Ishmaelites took him, no matter who bought him, no matter how far away he was from home, Joseph found out when he got there and as he was traveling there that nowhere he could go, he could walk out of the range of God. That God would be with him everywhere he went. He couldn't walk away from him. He couldn't turn away from him. You know what Joseph figured out and learned? That's a good lesson for us all. Joseph found out he was like a fish. Anybody have any aspirations of being a fish? <laughs> in this way, you'll want to be a fish. Joseph was like a fish in regard that like a fish, the presence of God covered him all around. There's nowhere he could move, nowhere he could go, nowhere where they could take him. 
to get him out of the reach of God's presence. Just like a fish in water. There's no way that fish can get out of the presence of water. That's what Joseph found out. And that's a mighty good lesson to know. I said, as we're walking in life, and I, I, it's irrelevant of the age. There's things that happen to our young people that are devastating. There's things that happen to, to, to young adults that are devastating. There's things that happen to middle age that are devastating. And there's things that are going to happen to older adults that are going to be devastating. And if we will learn that we'll never be out of the presence of God, yet though we're by ourselves, we will never be alone. That is a great lesson to know. That is a great lesson to know. That lesson and that reality of God's love for us will get us through obstacles and situations and things that this life will go on that we will have to live through. And the greatest miracles in life that we will find that God doesn't keep us from ever having to go down to Egypt, ever having to live the other side of that coin, but the greatest miracle in life that we can, we can stand firm that no matter what side of the coin we're on, the good side or the hard side, God will always be there with us. That's what got Joseph through. That's what Joseph counted on. And God blessed Joseph. We saw that in our scripture. God, Joseph could never go out of God's love, out of reach of his love, whether it be from the pit to the palace, God was always there. He could be alone, but, ne but yet never alone. And God's presence was with Joseph. And Joseph rested on that. We see other uh, characters, good, high-profile characters in the Bible. David said, David prayed, he pleaded. Uh, he pleaded with God, God, don't take your spirit from me. Don't take the presence from me. Don't take your presence from me. Moses said while he was on the mountain when he was leading millions of people down uh, at the foot of the mountain waiting on Moses to get revelation from God. Moses said this, God, if your presence doesn't go with us, it's not worth going. I'm paraphrasing. And the lesson that we need to know and the lesson I, I, hope, I, I hope you understand today, God loves us. God loves you. And there'll be two sides of life. There always has been, there always will. And even though we might be called to walk on the bottom side, on the tail side, if I can use that representation, God doesn't love us any less. God will not take his presence from us. And God will always, if we let him, always be in charge. And he will do things and bring about things that otherwise would never happen. The great reality of this story of Joseph was not what Joseph did. Joseph just laid back and didn't let his circumstances damp hamper his faith. What Joseph did was just allow God to work. That's what we need to learn. Let God work. Joseph found favor in Egypt because God was there. Joseph was alone, but he wasn't alone. He was in a worthless state, but God turned his worthlessness. He was a slave. He was nothing. Joseph was favored in, in the family. Joseph, Joseph had it easy uh, growing up. Joseph probably wasn't used to hard manual labor. Joseph probably never was in charge of much of anything of importance. But now, because of God, God put him in charge of everything. And Joseph rested in that. And not only did God put him in charge, God blessed everything that he touched, whether it be in the house or in the field. Because Joseph didn't try to outthink it. He didn't try to outmaneuver it. He simply rested in where God put him and let God do the rest. There's a great lesson there. And God blessed everything he touched. He was a captive, yet he was promoted. And we know the story of Joseph. He, he was a slave, but yet he ended up being prime minister of Egypt. Second in charge. God's nearness, God's nearness again, surrounded him like a fish. Hebrews 13, 5 said, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Oh, that's a lesson right there, isn't it? How many want something? I don't know about y'all. Y'all probably a lot better than I am. But sometimes people, people handle stress in different ways. Some people go to the refrigerator. I've been known to do that. Some people 
uh, clam up when they're in a stressful situation and don't share, just clam up, go in their shell. Some people do uh, a lot of things. Uh, 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 I tend to get something on my mind that I think I really, 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 really won't need. And I thank the Lord with the internet, boy, you can go research, you can look, and you can find every detail about it. You can go to YouTube and you can see whatever it is. Uh, uh, if it's around hunting season, the most time it's a new gun, new rifle. And I can look and I can go see the reviews and I can watch them shoot and they can take that thing down and put it together. And I, boy, I really want that. Boy, if I just had that, that's what I need. Boy, that would perk me up. If I could just get this, I could get through this. Middle-aged men, it's, they have the crisis, you know, and it's the cars and whatever it is. But we'll, if we're not careful, we, we, we will desire something. And 10 times out of 10, that something will be the counterfeit of what we really need. What we really need is the assurance and the realization that God is with us. Even though we might be down and out and depressed. And what Satan wants us to settle for is with a counterfeit. Whether it be something we want to buy or something we want to drink. Something we want to shoot in our arms. Something we want to sniff in our nose. Something we can go out and be promiscuous with or do things we ought not to do. See, Satan wants us to settle for the counterfeit. And Joseph didn't. And we shouldn't. Because God's got something better for us. And, and that's the lesson here. Be content with whatever you have. For he himself has said, and this is God, now I will never leave you or forsake you. If we can have the confidence, if we can just drill it in our heart and mind, that it doesn't matter whether I'm called here or called there. It doesn't matter if I have this or if I don't have this. It doesn't matter if I have the new car or if I don't have the new car. It doesn't matter if I get the big house or if I don't get the big house. What matters, like David prayed, God, don't take your presence from me. That's what matters. Because that's what sustained Joseph. That's what got him out of the pit and to the palace. Because Joseph rested assured that God was in control. Likewise, that's what we need to do. We can have everything. You see, if we'll get this mindset, if we'll get this mindset, if we'll get this heart set, that as long as I have God, as long as I have His presence, as long as I have fellowship with Him, as long as I can go <laughs> to wherever I need to go and get on my knees and pray to Him and I have the assurance I feel His presence, I can feel His presence when I'm walking down the hall at school, I can feel His presence when I'm in the car driving, I can even feel His presence when I just got the worst news of my life. God is there. You have everything that will make you a successful person. Remember how our scripture started out? Joseph was successful. Joseph was a slave. Joseph was living on the tail side of the coin. Joseph had everything taken away from him. Why was Joseph successful? Because he had the presence of God with him. And that was all he needed. That's what made him successful. Likewise today, I, I want you to claim this. I want you to claim God's character. The first thing is, is to be a child of His, to, to, to know Him personally, not rest on another relationship, on, your, on, on, a, on a friend's relationship that they have with Him, but have your own relationship with Him. Speak to Him as if He was right here, because He is right here. He is all around you. Speak to him. Share to him. And, and, and rest in his faithfulness that he loves you and he's got a plan for you and rest in that. Another thing to help you become like Joseph is to pray your heart to him. Well, what do you mean? I mean pray your heart. Anybody ever heard of Jeremiah? Sure you have. He's wrote some things in the Bible. You ever read what some of Jeremiah wrote? Jeremiah was one of the prophets in the Old Testament that prayed his complaints to God. You ever thought about that? Pray your heart. 
And this is important because you know what? He knows what you're thinking anyway. So you're not going to hide it from him. Jeremiah prayed his heart to God. God, why this? Why that? You ought to try doing that. And what you'll find is you pray your heart to God. You know what that's called? That's being honest with God. And you'll find, first of all, that God loves you so much, he's not going to turn his back and get mad at you and turn around and walk away. He'll be right there with you. He'll listen. And as you share your heart, you do it long enough, you do it sincere enough, you do it open enough, you'll feel his presence. And he won't probably show you all the ins and outs of what's to come, but he will give you a peace and assurance that he's there listening and that he's still in control and to rest in him. Be honest with him. Pray your heart. And you'll find he'll be faithful. He'll be assuring and comforting. And then what, what, what you got to do too is you got to lean on him. You got to lean on him. And we have it so much better than Joseph had because Joseph was in a strange land, a strange country. He didn't have fellow family. He didn't have fellow countrymen then at that time because he was sort of isolated. Later he did. But you have fellowship and you have the benefit of not only resting in God, but resting in the fellowship with his people. Ever thought about that? That as you fellowship with fellow Christians in a wonderful environment, say on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, other fellowship times, STMI classes, you're actually fellowshipping with God because you're fellowshipping with his representatives. And you look at it this way. And if, you, if, if you're called to live on the other side of the coin, it's like someone that's hungry. You think somebody was hungry and we feed a lot of people. We have a lot of folks come through our church, uh, through our food pantry. I've never, never known of a hungry person, a true hungry person, ever turn down the food pantry. Likewise, someone hungry for fellowship, hungry for the presence of God, hungry for support, hungry for, for something that's lasting as they live on the downside of the coin, why in the world do they ever turn down fellowship with God's people? Because God's people represent his presence. And they're there to encourage and comfort so take advantage of that. Joseph's story teaches us on the, that, that the other side of the street, God can show us that he's still there with us. Joseph's family was gone. His supporters were gone. His money was gone. His joy could have been gone, but it wasn't because he was alone, but not, not alone because God was with him. There's a great lesson here. We need to learn how to Rest where we are. We need to learn how to accept where we stand. That's not to say not to strive to be better, not to strive for something greater. But it does mean to rest here. And rest in the fact that God loves you. And if you're a child of His... His promise is he'll never leave you or forsake you. He knows where you are. And he knows when you're alone. But even when you're alone, you're not alone. Because he's there with you. you bow your head with me as they come and we'll continue in worship. But bow your head as we pray. And, and I, I just want you to know this morning... Life is cruel sometimes. It's tough. And there are pressures and there are burdens that go to each and every one of us. Some can be family related, some can be work related, some are financial, some are relational. It's a whole gamut of burdens that, 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 that truly Satan wants to use to weigh us down and to burden us, to cause anguish, to cause uh, lack of joy, to cause discouragement. 
But I want you to know this morning that God is there to help us. And God wants you to cast those cares, cast those burdens, cast those things on his shoulders because he's big enough to carry them. And not only is he big enough to carry those things, but he's also big enough to give you the confidence and the assurance that even though these might not be the best of times in your life right now, you'll get through it. Might take some time, but you'll get through it with his help. And in the meantime, don't do anything foolish. But don't be naive either. You'll get through this with God's help. And he wants you to trust him. Heavenly Father, this morning, Lord, as we have looked in your word and as we have seen how you worked in the life of Joseph, how you've taken a life that had everything and now turned out on the auction block, now as a slave in a household, and, but elevated to a high position because Joseph never gave up on you. God, I pray today, Lord, that as we continue worship this morning, if there's anyone here in the sound of my voice this morning, Father, that feels like that they're walking on the down side of the coin, on the other side of the street. Life is not as good as it used to be. There's things that they deal with that, that are taking the joy out of living. Father, would you help them rest in your care this morning? Would you reach out your hand of love through your spirit and touch their heart and assure them and comfort them? And would you, Father, do what only you can do? Or did you draw them close to you this morning? And Father, if there's a way that we can help, if, Lord, if there's those here this morning that'd like for us to pray with them, Lord, about something, Lord, would you give them the freedom to, to come and, and, and speak to us, Lord, so we can do that? We'd love to do that this morning. But Father... More importantly, you speak to them. You touch them. You lift them up. You encourage them. And Father, we'll give you praise for that. Speak to us, Lord, we pray. In the remaining moments of this service, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.